guys, good morning. Today is Tuesday. Today is Halloween and tomorrow is um, All Souls Day, which is a holy day of obligation for the Catholics. And on Thursday, the day following the holy day of obligation, which is All Souls, All the Souls in Heaven, um, is All Saints Day. So that's not a holy day of obligation, but it's nice to go to church for All Saints Day, too. So, at the end of our reading today, we are going to read a little... Yes, I had a little interruption there with the internet. Um, at the end of our reading today, we're going to do a little reading um, about Halloween from the Vatican. <laughs> I know it's scary, my... my um, skeleton but I don't have anything else that's that's what I used to wear when I worked at Joanne's for Halloween I still have it so I said you know I'll put it on I'll put it on <laughs> at least for you know the reading part and then tonight I'll wear it when I give out candies to the kiddos okay so today we're going to read Romans 8 18 through 25 And it's all about the present suffering and future glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we will reveal in that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager anticipation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to spons to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hoping for eternal life, right? Wow, this is kind of like a, a, a good reading for today. <laughs> Being October 31st, you know, it is, you know, we do have to... Um, we do have to accept the fact that we're all going to die, right? And um, our bodies will be left behind and we'll be going to eternal life. We'll be raising like Jesus. We will be um, in glorified bodies. So our bones, like I'm wearing here on my head, our bones will be left, you know, and um, only by God, the creator of all. Miracles will happen when Jesus comes back and he says, and he will come back. And everybody, the living and the dead, will have no end. So that means that at the end, we're going to be reunited with our bodies somehow. I believe that. Only God can do that. So um, here in the commentary for our reading today, it says... We are no longer cringing and fearful slaves. Instead, 
We are the master's children. What a privilege. Because we are God's children, we share in great treasures as co-heirs. God has already given us his best gifts, his son, his Holy Spirit, forgiveness, and eternal life. And he encourages us to ask him for whatever we need. Amen. Yes, he encourages us to ask. If we don't ask, he can't give us. We need to ask, and he will give to us according to his will, right? Sometimes we ask for things that he would not approve of. So, of course, he's not going to give us those things. He'll give us something else instead that we really need. There is a price for being identified with Jesus, along with being heirs of God. Paul also mentioned the suffering that Christians must face. What kinds of suffering are we to endure? For first century believers, there was economic and social persecution, and some even faced death. We too must pay a price for following Jesus in many parts of the world today. Christians face pressures just as severe as those faced by Christ's first followers. Even in countries where Christianity is tolerated or encouraged, Christians must not become complacent to live as Jesus did, serving others, giving up one's own rights, resisting pressure to conform to the world, always exacts a price. Nothing we suffer, however, can compare to the great price that Jesus paid to save us. Amen. I feel like we read that yesterday. What was yesterday's reading? Okay, yesterday's reading was Romans 8, 12 through 17. And today it was 8, 18 through 25. So that was a commentary for both. I just remembered reading that commentary before. I remember struggling with the same word (laughs) to pronounce it correctly. It was, what word was it? Complacent. 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 I remember struggling with that word. So I'm like, you know what? I read this yesterday. Okay. But it's very true. Yes. Jesus paid a price that none of us can pay that big of a price. He, he he was God. He was God made man come to earth as God's only son, which is a mystery in itself. You know, if you sit around and you start thinking about it, that's why we got to say Isaiah 55, 8, 9, his ways are way higher than our ways. We just have to have faith and believe and accept and follow. And obey. That's it. All those other questions. Anything is possible with God. So why even try to analyze stuff, right? Sin has caused all creation to fall from perfect state in which God created it. So the world is subject to frustration and bondage to decay so that it cannot fulfill its intended purpose. One day, all creation will be liberated and transformed. Until that time, it waits in eager expectation for the resurrection of God's children. Amen. Amen. And that's why God hasn't, um, I mean, that's why the end of the world hasn't happened yet. Because God has a plan. And he has a book written for all those people that haven't even been born yet. So we all need to patiently await. We are all followers, so we need to obey. And it says in the um, in the confirmation of faith in that, is it called the conf- I don't know why I can't think. My mind went blank. You know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen, you know, that we say every Sunday at church. Um, 
it's in there at the end. You know, as we say it, we think and believe what we're saying because that is our that is our pledge. That is our confirmation of faith, right? We will be resurrected with glorified bodies like the body Christ has now in heaven. Amen. And that's also in Corinthians 1, Corinthians 15, 25 through 58. We have the first fruits, the first installment or down payment of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee to our resurrection life. It is natural for children to trust their parents, even though parents sometimes fail to keep their promises. Our Heavenly Father, however, never makes promises he won't keep. Nevertheless, his plan may take more time than we expect. What are you and what am I waiting for? New bodies, a new heaven, a new earth? Rest and rewards, our eternal family and home, the absence of sin and suffering, and being face to face with Jesus, rather than acting like impatient children as we wait for God, God's will to unfold, we should place our confidence in God's goodness and wisdom. Amen. Kind of like the kids waiting on Christmas for Santa Claus. <laughs> Right? You know, we're like, oh man, you know. And then we're always, we always have in our minds, you know, what's it going to be like? What's going to happen? There's this movie out. Actually, this is a good week to watch it being All oh, Saints Day, All oh, Souls Day, the celebration of, Hall of, of Halloween that we give out candy to people, which I don't know why that really started. That's, but um, I do know that All oh, Souls. It's the hollow before the All Souls Day. So um, I'm sure the Vatican has a good explanation there. I'll read it in just a little bit. Um, but yeah, we um, we just eagerly await. Well, I'm not, I'm awaiting and I'm happy that we're going to eternal life. But I kind of want to live a little longer. So I'm okay with being here. <laughs> In this world a little longer. I will try to make the best of it, Lord. I will try to be holier every day. And please, um, you know, be with us. And, yeah. I'm not like, oh, my gosh, I can't wait. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited it's coming. But, you know, I, I, I like being here, too. I know it's going to be awesome over the, you know, in, in, in heaven. It's going to be way better than here, of course. But, um, yeah, yeah, you guys know what I mean. It's like, it's great, and we're, we're wanting that at the end of our lives. But God's will be done, and we're going to be living here for a while, so we can't hurry stuff. We've got to just be patient and just live, live the way he wants us to live, right? In Romans, Paul presents the idea that salvation is past, present, and future. It is past because we were saved the moment we believed in Jesus Christ as Savior. Our new life, eternal life, begins at that moment. And, it's in, and it is present because we are being saved. This is the process of sanctification. But at the same time, we have not fully received all the benefits and blessings of salvation that will be ours when Christ's new kingdom is completely established. That's our future salvation. While we can be confident of our salvation, we still look ahead with hope and trust toward that complete change of body and personality that lies beyond this life, when we will be like Christ. That's also in John 1, John 3, 2. Amen. Yeah, and... Um, and Stephen, our, our brother in Christ that is a very powerful prayer warrior also, um, he always says, eternal life already started, <laughs> right? He always corrects me when I say, you know, eternal life, that's what we're hoping for. He's like, it's already here. It's already started. So, you know, it's up to us to keep it, right? 
because um, it's true. It says it right here. The moment that we are baptized, the moment that we accept Christ in our lives, you know, that's that's when it starts. Anyways, also there is no there is no uh, time in heaven. There is no time in the spiritual realm. That's why we can pray today for our family members that have already died. We can pray for them because since the time is standstill, it it will count toward them. Like I it's 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 hard to wrap my head around it, but Maybe if um, Stephen was on, he can explain it <laughs> But um, we can't wrap our heads around it completely, but there's no time in heaven. There's no time in the spiritual realm. So we can pray for people, even though they already died, even though, you know, it's past whatever it was we were praying for. We can still pray about it because... God will listen and it will be counted toward um, whatever it is we're praying for, right? Amen. Yes, I heard that. I heard that Father Chris Aller, I like to listen to his uh, podcast. He's in divinemercy.org that I like to listen to when I do my uh, chaplet of divine mercy around three, uh, three o'clock. I do it with them. They do a live one every day. It's beautiful. And um, he has awesome podcasts. So it's divinemercy.org. And they're all free, guys. And you can put any kind of a, of a question in there. And he has a podcast for it. And he talks about, um, I believe it was his, I have a great book that he wrote too. That, oh, I go to it constantly, constantly. It's called understanding divine mercy and i always have it next to me because i go to it a, a lot and if you um text them or not text, text them you email them to divinemercy.org it's in the back the divine mercy it's backwards i don't know how to fix it on my phone the divinemercy.org there's also a phone number i'll take a picture of it and put it on the comments in case you guys are interested and if you guys don't do internet like i don't really do very much only facetime i mean facebook i do the lives and i do emails but that's it i called the number and i told them i wanted the free book and they gave it to me free of course they'll ask for a donation but if you don't have it to give that's fine they'll give it to you free and in there, it's amazing because he explains the divine mercy so well. And um, he also has another book on suicide. And um, it's really sad. It doesn't just talk about suicide. His other book, I don't have it here with me. It talks also about any kind of, um, any kind of, of, anything you're addicted to, any kind of addiction it talks about. And his, I believe it was his aunt, if I'm not mistaken, um, committed suicide. She died. And he talks about it a lot in his books. Um, and he said that he still prays for her because there's no time in heaven. Heaven, you know, the, the time stops and he prays for her because God's going to count that toward um, her and it's going to help her get out of purgatory if she's in purgatory or wherever she may be. Um, anyway, so let's read the devotional today, which is in the word among us here. Or Romans 8, 18, 25. The sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. Romans 8, 18. How's your imagination? Can you picture the glory to be revealed in the whole creation once Christ returns to establish his kingdom? It might mean roses without thorns, summer nights without mosquitoes, clear running streams without pollution, and the end of violence, weather, and disease. 
how would the world's people experience that kingdom? Surely there would be no more war, exploitation, tyranny, poverty, hatred, addictions, or divorce. If this little exercise taxed your imagination, you're in good company. When St. Paul describes this kingdom, what God has prepared for those who love him, he says it's something that I has not seen and ear has not heard and what has not entered the human heart. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. That's the mystery of the hope we have in Christ. Not only will we ourselves be restored in glorified bodies, but creation itself will also be restored. Of course, this will only be fully realized in the new heaven and the new earth. Suffering and consequences of sin are all too apparent in the world around us, and we can groan with ourselves under the weight of it all. But instead of groaning, let's pay closer attention to the eager longing the Holy Spirit has placed within us. Let's try to heighten our expectation of the glory to come. We can see traces of this glory all around us. It's there in each multicolored autumn leaf or chrysanthemum in full bloom. You get a glimpse of it when the varied voices at church join together in praise of God or when people love one another sacrificially. When the Lord opens our eyes to this glory, we can live with the joy and hope that it will one day be revealed in its fullness. Don't let the suffering of this present time distract you or discourage you. Keep looking for the ways that God is seasonally at work. He is making all things new. Jesus, strengthen my hope in the glory you have in store for me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Lord, so much for our reading today, for giving us that hope. It's so hard sometimes we look at everything happening and all this hatred out there in the world, and 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 we just get discouraged. But if, if we look into your holy book in the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, it's everywhere. And it's just part of this world we live in, Lord. And you're making us realize that there is hope for the new Jerusalem, for the new kingdom that await us, that you have a room for us in. We thank you, Lord. And we ask you to continue giving us hope, continue being with us, present in our, in our hearts and our lives. Keep sending us little signs that you are there. And we will continue praying, praying for all those that are in need of a change of heart. We love you so much, Lord. Please be with us through these, this uh, holy week, this holy week of all those that we love that have died, All Souls Day tomorrow and All Saints Day on um, Thursday, the next day. And please be with all those little little trick-or-treaters that will be coming to our doors to get candy tonight. Just, just keep them safe, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Good morning, Joe. Good morning, yes. Happy Halloween to you, too. You got candy ready for the, for the neighborhood kids that come by to ask for candy? <laughs> Sometimes I go up front and I sit like... In the front, you know, it's a good idea to sit in the front of the, like, garage door or a little bit out there during the time that you're giving out candy. So it's a little easier for them. I have steps and stuff going up. So sometimes, and it's a little dark, and I have a lot of, a lot of, like, weeds and plants growing big time in my hair. <laughs> so it's hard to get through all that sometimes for them. So if you make it a little easier, you might get more trick-or-treaters coming to you. So let, before we leave today, let me read a quick, well, it's not that quick, but it's a good reminder 
of from the Vatican. It's from the Vatican News. It talks a little bit about Halloween and this week of, of Halloween that we are in. The Catholic roots of Halloween, the vigil of All Saints Day. Although Halloween has been embraced by the secular world, its foundations are firmly rooted in the Catholic tradition. Dr. Malcolm Brown of the Alcum Institute for Catholic Culture explains the significance of All Hallows' Eve. And this is by Christopher Wells. In the modern world, and especially in English-speaking countries, Halloween has been one of the most important holidays of the year, with millions of children and adults dressing up as their favorite heroes, superstars, ghouls, and goblins. While some people have connected Halloween so earlier pagan to earlier pagan celebrations of the new year, Halloween actually has significant Catholic roots. The name itself comes from All Hallows' Eve, that is, a vigil of All Saints' Day. When Catholics remember those who have gone before us to enter our heavenly home immediately afterwards, on November 2, the Church commemorates all the faithful departed still detained in purgatory and prays in suffrage for them. The memory of those who have gone before us naturally leads to thoughts of mortality and the liturgical focus on the end times during this period of the church year adds to the atmosphere of gloom. In Memorandum on the Celebration of Halloween, issues last year for his diocese, Bishop David Condurla of Tulsa, Oklahoma, stresses the importance of maintaining the Catholic meaning and purpose of all holy days, especially those which have been adopted and adapted by the culture around us. He explains the how customs such as dressing up for Halloween and appealing to frightful imagery can be done in a Catholic spirit while warning that we want to intentionally avoid those things that are contrary to our Catholic faith, but have become popularized through the secular adaption of Halloween. Vatican News spoke with Dr. Marcel Brown of the Alkium Institute of Catholic Culture in Tulsa about the Catholic roots of Halloween. The Feast of Halloween is one of those feasts on the Catholic calendar that is celebrated on the eve of a great solemnity, he said. Dr. Brown explained that the word Halloween refers to the Feast of All Saints. The word itself has taken an old English term, hollows, meaning holy, and in a tron of the word evening in reference to the vigil of the feast. So really, Halloween is the feast of the celebration of the Feast of All Hallows, he said. So it's a day when Catholics celebrate the triumph of the church in heaven and the lives of the saints on earth. The modern focus of the eerie or mysterious also has a Catholic aspect. When we think of Halloween, I think we often think of ghosts and goblins and ghoulish faces, Dr. Brown said. But even these in the Catholic tradition are supposed to be reminders of death and of the last things. He continued, So just as we commemorate the Feast of All Saints on November 1st, Beginning with All Hallows' Eve on Halloween, we also think about the turn and turn our minds really to the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And really, our focus should be since we all must die and are destined to judgment, how then we to live. In this memorandum, Bishop Conorla 
invites to the faithful to urge one another this Halloween to express in every detail of our observance the beauty and depth of the Feast of All Saints. Let us make this year's celebration, he says, an act of true devotion to God, whose saints give us hope that we may one day enter into the kingdom prepared for God's holy ones from the beginning of time. Amen. That was very interesting. I really enjoyed that little quick read. So if you're going to go out there and give out candy, it's okay. <laughs> tomorrow, just remember, tomorrow is a holy day of obligation for all the souls. And I'm sure you have souls in heaven already awaiting you. Um, so just, you know, light a candle for them at church. They have the beautiful service that they light. The, you know, you you go up there and you light the candles for for those that you love that are in heaven already. So um, make sure you, you make a, you take an hour and you plan it to be able to be present at some kind of a, of a mass tomorrow. They have mass in the evenings also all over. They have seven o'clock masses. They have as early as 7 a.m. masses here around my proximity, about 20 miles in my proximity. There's a 7 a.m. daily mass, 7.30 a.m. daily mass, 8.30 a.m. daily mass, and then they go on. They have noon masses and so on, and all the way up to 7 in the evening. So there's always um, a chance for you to go and, and do the little celebration and light a candle for those loved ones that are in heaven. May the Lord bless you all and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you all kindly and give you peace and love and safety out there today and protection and boldness to preach Christ crucified to the world. Amen. Bye-bye. We'll see you later, God willing. Bye-bye.